This is the 18th season of Bass Talk Live. With your host, Matt Pangrad. BTL is brought to you by Lorenz, Bass Cat Boats, AFCO, Ducket Fishing, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Baits, Spro, X Zone Lures, Gamakoxi, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods and Pro Guy Fats. PTL coming at you. It is Wednesday, January 5th, and we are wrapping up the first, I guess, regular week of BTL in 2022. We have Uncle Frank who will be on tomorrow for his regularly scheduled day four. And uh, Uncle Frank is going to be talking about rogue fishing, which is something that our guest today has done just a very little bit of probably. He's probably, I've seen him backstage, he's probably going to get his rogue box right now. But we got Jason Christie on the show today. And I figured, I figured with the history that Jason and I have that goes back probably a couple years. There's no better way to kick off my first week of solo Bass Talk live shows than to go with what I would consider a couple challenging interviews. Uh, You know, I kind of played it safe first day, had Bradley Hallman in studio. Now, that would have been a challenging interview three years ago, but now Bradley Hallman has 25,000 YouTube subscribers and talks to a camera for an hour every single day, and he's all about it. So that was an easy show. Then I had Jordan Lee on yesterday. And, like, Jordan Lee's not, like, super chatty but he brought it and I, I don't know what jason has in store but jordan had i think five baits that he'd won a million dollars on and he went through each one of those and we talked to him for almost an hour yesterday so we got jason on today i want to cover a bunch of things uh this will be a little bit outside of bass fishing obviously there's going to be a little bit of hunting involved a little bit of crappie fishing there's some video of him downhill skiing Uh, I'm not sure how comfortable he was with that. I know he was a former college athlete, but uh, we'll get into that. But here's the thing. So I'm driving into the studio this morning, first thing. And uh, the first thing that I notice, I pull up YouTube to make sure that everything's regularly scheduled, that the stream's going with Jason. It says, Smallmouth Crush is live. And it's like 6.30 in the morning. And when I went to bed at 11... Travis Manson from Smallmouth Crush was streaming too, and it turns out that uh, Travis has been streaming for like 24 hours now and is pretty much, I think the way he described it to me, he's going to go like Big Brother in his studio to where you could log on basically 24 hours a day and watch it. If you don't know uh, who Smallmouth Crush Travis Manson is, he's Dude, here's the thing. So, like, I've known Travis for a number of years, and probably four or five years ago now, he was like, man, I want to get into this deal. I want to live stream. I want to kind of do a show. Big-time smallmouth guy, guides up there on Thousand Islands and and, uh, Wisconsin and and the Chesapeake Bay, and he's, like, grown it into a deal now. He's got merch. He's making a living out of it. But I said, man, I said, I know we had a 24-hour show scheduled with uh, Mark Jeffries, and then that you know, kind of went by the wayside when he had his fall. And then we're like, wow, 24 hours is a long time. But I want to bring in, uh, just for the first segment, before we get to Jason here in three or four minutes, I want to bring in Travis. Just to, you seriously have been, this is Travis Manson's smallmouth crush. I mean, fish the Elite Series for what, two, three years there. Uh, We've had you on before and talk like you didn't even know how to bass fish and you qualified for the elite series and like learned how to bass fish on it. And then 16 top 10, $60,000 with MLF. So now you're a 24 hour live streamer in the fishing industry, Travis. Well, first of all, I don't know if this is a safe interview or not. But, I already uh, set it up for you as like, there's some parameters here. This can't be smallmouth crush after hours. I just wanted, I, I found this interesting. Like I had Charlie Hartley on yesterday with the story and now you're kind of pushing the limits of what I've seen as far as live streaming in the fishing game. Well, I wanted to bring the viewers a little bit of extra, you know, we go live every week 
on the show and it's always uh it's always interesting of course you were our last guest uh on last monday and uh you can testify to that it was definitely an interesting show but i wanted to do something where we would actually jump on a live throughout the week just randomly so we're going to call that small mouth crush random lives <laughs> which will be a little more detailed okay i'll interact a little bit more uh with the viewers but then i wanted to take it a step further and i thought how about small mouth crush garage cam how long have you been streaming right now your eyes are a little well you look tired travis so it literally is is pretty crazy i just decided to hit the button set the camera up i did a little shopping this morning i'm going to get a couple more cameras are going to be sent here to my house <laughs> hopefully this afternoon amazon's amazing uh, same day shipping and uh i got like an adapter for one of the cameras so i can run yeah. a 30 foot cord so i want to get things set up a little bit differently here in the garage and maybe take it a step further i'm thinking multi-room you just click a button maybe we can get this set up on the website where you know if you want a living room view if you want the bedroom view whatever we're gonna we're gonna get cameras set up everywhere and uh and see how it goes are you like you said there was some activity you had a good a, a lively chat at 3 a.m yeah, I was surprised. So, of course, I went to bed uh, around 11 o'clock. Just kept it rolling. And let her go. Uh, lights were off. And uh, sure enough, around 3 a.m., there was a bunch of chatter, a lot of comments coming in still. We don't have a lot going on right now. This morning was was fairly slow. We had about 100 viewers at, at one time. Uh, right now, we're at 12. So we got a little bit of work to do. So what Kyle says, is this going to be like the Truman Show? It could be. It could be. Anyway, I just wanted to get you on to get your thoughts on that. I had not seen anything like that. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of live streams, a lot of shows, a lot of things going on in the evening. But kudos to you, Travis, for just uh, let the cameras roll all night long in the shop as you uh, work on your new merchandise and work on the Small Mouth Crush podcast. And what's the next uh, Small Mouth Crush podcast coming out? Basically, podcast focuses exclusively on small mouth angling, right? Yes, yeah, so season one was the top 52 smallmouth bass anglers across the country. Was Frank Scalish in that list? Of course he was. I remember he called me and he's like, okay, who's this guy, smallmouth Travis, he wants to do it? I said, yeah, yeah. Uh, he vetted you before he agreed to it. A couple people did. Joe Baylog vetted me. Um, there was a few, but we were able to get them all on and uh, complete a full series. Season two is a little bit different. We're talking with the top local and regional anglers across the country. And already did some uh, some taping, so we got a, a pretty good uh, lineup of guests. Uh, really, starting January 9th will be the next uh, the next podcast, and that's every other week because 52 was just a little too much for me. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna tame it down a little bit for next next season. Every other week, but I'm trying to do a hundred, I think 150 some plus fish all nine, and fish all over the country. I'm gonna be sleeping less than you. I know you're gonna turn into a vampire. All right. Well, it's good to see you in an interview without wearing a vest. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Take it easy. Thanks, Travis. That is uh, Travis Manson, a smallmouth crush. We go uh, way back, uh, room together in that uh, Costa Championship in 2019 on uh, Cumberland. And we both made the top 10 there. That's That's one of the cool things I've done. Like when you work, I've covered the Elite Series and stuff, and it's it's kind of an awkward vibe sometimes like you know like you're in a house and i just you know covering it but you've got three or four elite series guys there and like one of them smashes them and three of them are not good it's an interesting vibe between like you've got some guys that just like want to have a couple jack and cokes and decompress after the days and other guys who uh made the top 10 so we are going to take a quick break and when we come back i see jason christy in the queue for the third interview of the 2022 season. We'll be back with Jason Christie. The Ultimate Fishing System by Lowrance. Your choice of powerful fish finding tools, all connected. From sonar and trolling motor to navigation and networking. To fit the way you fish. All with touch screen control from HDS Live, the heart of your system. Find more, see more, catch more with the Ultimate Fishing System by Lowrance. Upgrade to the Ultimate Fishing System and get up to $1,000 cash back. 
The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. We are back, Bass Talk Live. It is Wednesday, January 5th, and yes, we are looking at the man, Jason Christie right there. I think we've got a decent signal. We've got him in the AFCO Reaper. I believe in the last 48 hours, he is both downed, and I'm not a hunter, so I don't know if this is the right terminology. He has downed a quality buck, and he has also wrangled what appeared to be a seven to eight pounder. Now, I couldn't tell. There's different angles. Some guys can make him look bigger, but that looked like a really big one, and those were back-to-back -back posts. So is that an accurate 48 hours? You have, uh, you've conquered both the land and the sea um yeah that and that bass actually weighed 8.57 we put it on the scales 857 uh, yep long i do have long arms but uh we weighed it we got it on video 857 is this like a super public lake or is this like a public lake that you don't talk about mm, dude i can't answer that question i mean uh, I don't want everybody over there fishing for the next week. I hear you. So what about the what about the buck then? Um, he just to say it the best. What does that compare in a fishing term? Was that a six pounder or a seven pounder? Like that's how I do bucks. Like I ask my buddies when they send me, they're like, "Hey, look at this deer," and I'm like, "Okay, equate that to a Oklahoma largemouth." Yeah, I mean Oklahoma largemouth. It's like a six, six and a half pounder. It wasn't the biggest one I've ever killed. It was just he chose to to walk by the wrong person at the wrong time because I've had sat in a tree a lot this year in Oklahoma and I've passed and I've passed and I've passed bigger deer than the one I killed a couple of days ago. But we get two buck tags in Oklahoma and I just hadn't killed one and I have a deer that I'm hunting. He's just he's being weird. Um, you know we've had a weird winter. We're just now getting the kind of weather that I needed to to get him hopefully tomorrow is going to be the day i'm going to go fishing today and and then to hopefully tomorrow i can get him what does uh, that mean done and then start fishing so but yeah he's a six six and a half pounder i mean in oklahoma you know you're going to a 10 11 pounder is about as good as you can do in oklahoma on average i know there's going to be somebody right now say i caught a 13 i caught a 14 <laughs> oklahoma. on average for the average person a six pounder is a good fish in oklahoma what does that mean when a deer's being weird? He just, um, I mean, there, I've seen signs of them still rutting. I got some deers, that's, some bucks that's losing their horns. It's just like they're all over the place. You know, um, a lot of people have commented lately about the about us having warm weather. Oh, it's so nice. All it's right. so nice. Well, you don't realize, what people don't realize to have that great spring fishing, you have to have a winter. You know what I mean? If not, they're just going to trickle into the bank. Like uh, Florida, and, then. It's kind of like Florida, where they're just yeah. all over. There's no big wave. Right. And that's that's what uh, it's kind of been on deer season. We just It's just trickled out so long that there wasn't, you know, that peak two or three weeks. It's just been, it's been weird. And to be honestly, to be honest, they've had me a little confused um, the whole deer season. So, uh, and I've killed a couple good ones, but um, I have spent more time in a tree this year than than I ever have. And a lot of it's just watching. You know, I I have more fun going uh, sitting in a tree than I actually do uh, shooting a deer. Like so. when you get one picked out, is there any correlation between like a finicky pressured eight pounder on a bed and then like a buck that you pick out like is there is it kind of the same dance between those two as far as 
your move, their move? Would you say that those are probably the two closest related things between fishing and hunting? Absolutely. Um, and, and what I try to do, I mean, I don't want it to be, but it ends up being, it gets personal. And that's why like at the beginning of the year, I, you know, I'm like, all right, this is, there's, here's two deer. These are the two deer I want to hunt. You know, in most cases, they're the biggest one on the property. Um, and it becomes personal. You know, I killed one last year that I literally chased for four to five years. Um, and by the time I killed him, he was going down, but he hangs dead center in my living room because he was the one that pissed me off for five years. I mean, like <laughs> dude, I lost sleep. I, I had 14 encounters with him, 14 encounters with him before I killed him. I draw my boat. On, I had drawn my bow on him three times. Um, I had shot him once and just grazed him and missed him. No, I drawed four times, missed him once and then drew another time right at dark. And I didn't feel comfortable letting it go. So I came down 14 encounters and finally got it. But yeah, it's just like an eight pounder when it, whenever he's there and that eight pounder, but it becomes personal. I'm not leaving until I catch him. All right. So there's a lot. So like I said, I don't, I don't hunt. I actually just sat in a, I don't even want to call it a stand. It had like computer chairs, a snack bar, a heater <laughs> in it, and windows. It's my my buddy Juice has it, but it was the first time I'd ever sat like in a deer stand and like watched deer hunting. I just didn't grow up doing that, right? Like I fished power plant lakes and stuff growing up. Never got into the hunting, but yep. I'm around a lot of guys. I hear them talk hunting and all the time. Would you say that there's more more guys who are are uh, great hunters? and poor fishermen or more people who are great fishermen and poor hunters? Or do you think if you do both, a lot of the great fishermen are also great hunters or vice versa? I think that it um, overlaps for sure. I mean, you look at Hackney. um, I mean, we have a lot of guys out Mm -hmm. there. Um, And there's a lot of guys that don't fish professionally that I know that are avid on both avenues, fishing and deer hunting. But I think it carries over. I think, You know, we did, Steve Bowman and I uh, and Hackney did an article in Bassmaster about how it all correlates. And some of it's just patience, some of it's stubbornness, uh, and some of it's just reading the surroundings, you know. Uh, And I'm not going to lie, I'm not the best hunter out there. I'm just very fortunate that I can spend a lot of time in a deer stand. I mean, I'm not Mm -hmm. the worst hunter, but, you know, I I can go – about whenever I want to go, you know, I have great sponsors that understand what I love, which is deer hunting. And they, they don't ask a lot during deer season. I mean, I'll do some stuff, but, uh, you know, they let me do what I want to do. And it just, I get to, I get to be out there and, and, uh, it's fun, but yeah, a lot of the same things in fishing kind of jump over to deer hunting. Are there like, power hunters and finesse hunters like oh, yeah. specialty like is, that, is, is you know like in fishing like you're you're a power fisherman hackney's a power fisherman like brent Ayler's a finesse fisherman are there that same exact correlations in hunting yeah you get the guys you know you get the guys that go out and sit in the middle of a wheat field in a blind uh with a heater is that power saying, hunting What's wrong with that uh and then you know i'm the kind of guy that's going to go you know, walk a, a mile through the thickest stuff, you know, getting a tree. And I don't care if I see three deer or I don't care if I just see one, one as long as it's the right one. So, uh, I shouldn't have said that about the blinds because people are going to, uh, but I mean, there's been a lot of big deer kill out of the blinds, but I'm just not, I don't know if that correlates as far as finesse and power, but you know, you got guys that walk around and stalk them. Uh, we're not able to do that where the kind of property that is the walk and stock kind of like the fly fisherman could be. Yeah. (laughs) But except with the fly, instead of having a fly rod, they're probably, they're probably walking in the creek carrying a spear. That would be a power fisherman power. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done the hog spearing or any of that crazy stuff? No, that exists. Doesn't it? Yeah. My uncle tried to go get me to go one night and, uh, I just, I mean, I, I didn't do it. So, all right, let's get to the fishing, dude. You're going on your, uh, if you count the BFLs, you're like 
well over your, you're going in on your 22nd season of this since you won your first BFL in 2001 on Grand. Does you know it seem like it's been 22 years? But yeah, that's what's bad is that, dude, I feel like I'm 19. I mean, I physically, my mid-30s, but mentally, I feel like I'm 19 still. And I say that meaning that I still do stupid stuff. I mean, the viewers know that. But, you know, my, I, I'm still stubborn. I'm never not going to be stubborn. But, you know, I feel good. Um, you know, it's been a stressful, this is going to be a really stressful January just because I don't have a boat yet, um, you know, and I have to get it rigged. I got to get it wrapped. You know, we're going to Florida. Um, we're doing a lot of things around the house. I'm trying to get a house going. Um, it's just been crazy. So, uh, but I'm ready to go. Like you don't have, like you're, I mean, you guys start pretty soon. I know. I leave here uh, January the 30th. We're going to go to uh, Florida and film for three or four days before uh, we start fishing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I need to go, but it always happens. You know, I, I'm just yeah. not a guy. I like to have my stuff early, you know, and be settled in rather than uh, pulling out of the parking lot and the dude's putting a little tape on for the wrap. I don't like that. <laughs> okay, so so 25 days, so it breaks down like you're, do you have to go get the boat or will someone bring the boat to you? Um, just depends. I feel like you I maybe have reached the status where they bring the boat to you. I don't know about that. Uh, it just I feel like that's a possibility. I, yeah, it just depends on what I have going that day. I mean, I you know, I may run and get it. I may send somebody. They may send it. Um, but as soon as that thing's ready, um, you know, and it's not just the boat. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the same thing with baits. And, I mean, I got a new truck sitting right here. I saw so, that. I, everything is behind. I mean, you know, you might have a new truck sitting there that's missing one part that's can't be built. So it's just like everything else. It's it's just uh, it's a mess. So so you'll do that. You'll Then you'll it takes, what, two days? You'll get it in. It takes, what, two days to get it wrapped? Um, the Express, that they actually can wrap it. He can wrap it in a half a day because all you have is sidewalls. Uh. Uh, so it's really easy. We have to install the sea deck, um, you know, and it really takes two days to do rigging. And I mean, you take that over to the bass tank. It'll go to the bass tank. Yes. And they'll knock that out in two days. And then you have to do the stuff. What do you do to your truck? Just uh, make it look cool. Yeah, I got to get it. And it's not going to happen. I will not be driving this 22 uh, okay. when the season starts. I mean, cause there's no aftermarket parts available yet i mean i literally uh, think i got the first truck in the area um there's no we look there's no lift kits you know i got wheels and tires that's it i got to get a camper built for it there's no mold so they have to <laughs> literally come in and they're going to build the camper here leave me the first one take the mold back so it's just a process and and uh I wish it would have been done in October, but it, you're a veteran now. You've done this at every level with every league. Do you think the situation, I don't want to call it a situation, but do you think what you're facing right now is one of the biggest hurdles for the new Elite Series guys coming in this year that are facing the same thing but but have never been through it and haven't been like, oh, it'll eventually all come together? Like, How long does it take to get used to being uncomfortable with the preparation process and timing? Um. I think it depends on your personality. I am a person that when I leave here, I want everything in my truck, everything in my boat. I mean, new line, everything. I want everything just perfect. I want to be organized. I want to take care of all of the variables that I can. I, you know, and, and I know some guys are comfortable with arriving to, at Florida, having their boats and trucks wrapped on the spot, getting their jerseys shipped in, you know, they might get fresh line, they might not. And I'm not that person. Like, I want everything um, done when I leave here. And, you know, it just, there's some anxiety on leaving. I mean, dude, I've been in it <laughs> for the most part of the last three months where life is, you know, calm. And now, you know, literally Monday, I woke up and I'm like, holy beep, it's about time to go. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm starting to, but, but really, I'm ahead of the game. You know, this happens every year. I'll jump into it. I'll be rigged and ready in a few days. 
and then I just spend some time fishing around here. So, are, are you uh, like that before every night of tournaments too? Are you a are you a dude who's out in the boat making sure everything's ready every single night before tournaments, no matter what, or do you kind of have some stuff that's askew on the feet? You're not a Kelly Jordan style of guy, are you? No, no, I I am that guy. I want everything to be ready. But the good thing about me, you know, I I stayed with Edwin, and I actually had a we had a long phone call last night. I stayed with Edwin. And we were both the same. We want everything perfect. But the difference between him and me was I had to rig three rods and he had to rig 25. So it's not that big of a process during tournament season for me. Uh, You know, I'm pretty simple on that. He's a different kind of fisherman. So he had a lot of rods laid out. He had to rig a lot. I'd be in, you know, we always had a race and I won almost every time on getting our stuff ready. And, uh, but the difference was, is I was rigging three, four, five rods, and he was, I mean, rigging everything. So uh, across the board, because he tends to use a lot of rods during the day. It's it's interesting you mentioned that because I was going back through uh, your career, and obviously everyone wants to come on. They want to talk to you about rogues. They want to talk to you about spinner baits. What I do, I show just, hey, have you seen seen this spinner bait before? And held up one. It had like the red head. I think it was like an old a guy named Maynard, who's a retired teacher, sent us these. But it's got you know, it's single Colorado. It's got a red yep. head. It's got the flat rubber on. I think it's an old Jimmy Houston. They. Is it a Jimmy Houston or is it a is it a is it called an Oki? Uh, it might be an Oki bug, yeah, an Oki yeah. bug deal. But anyway, he sent it because we were talking about your spinner baits, and he's like, "I got one of those from like the '80s." So yeah, yeah. It, we'll and get to that in a second. Because but I wanted to. I remember go for it. going when I was a kid. There was a tackle store in Tulsa, and I I don't remember the name of it, but I could I could close my eyes. You know, you you went in on fifty one. I think you got off on Memorial. As soon as you cross the tracks, you turn left. It might have been Oki Bait and Tackle or something like that. And I think that's where that spinner bait come from. But I remember okay. going there. And uh, when I was a kid, you know, we made a trip there during the winter and we'd get a few baits and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I remember that. It's pretty cool. You've, so you've thrown that one. And then I think this one might be the Jimmy Houston one. It's yep. got the flat rubber on it, it's just super small. But yeah. everyone wants to talk to you about rogues and the spinner baits, and I started to go back through. And obviously, um, mysteriously, all of your BFL wins are spinner baits in the Mid Lake region on Grand Lake. Who knows how much of that is true? Oh, that's but, not true. <laughs> I, that's not true. Uh, but so I went back through. You've won on a bunch of different stuff. For like a guy who's like a power fisherman, you've won a, an event on top water. You've yep. won events like frogging. You've won a tour event on a on a umbrella rig Mm -hmm. uh you've won a number of different ways that i think people uh you've won snapping a tube i think and i've thought about this you know i'm kind of getting the reputation of being the spinnerbait guy and it's kind of went away from flipping it used to be flipping now it's spinnerbait and it's only because i won an event but of all of the events that i've won not counting the bfl you know the tour level events costa events only two have been on a spinnerbait. I think I think where the spinnerbait came from was the classics. You know, uh, a lot of people watching mm-hmm. that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, snapping a tube, top water. Your uh, first win, the Strand series, it came cranking and throwing a big worm. Yeah, you've won completely across the board. Have you won anything on a spinning rod? A major event, primarily using a spinning rod. Is that? No, I lost a five pounder once uh, at the boat to win the cup at Lanier uh, on a spinning rod. You know, I I won at St. Clair both times, but it was both on a bait caster. I mean, I just, I snap a tube on a bait caster, which is, you know, they want to put me under the jail up north for that, but that's just <laughs> what I feel more. I can snap it a lot harder with a bait caster than I can a spinning rod. Hey, you mentioned it, and I wanted to, uh, it kind of jogged my memory here. Was one of your tube snapping winds up there on St. Clair. Was that one of like the early iterations of uh forward facing sonar? Hmm. Like like soup like super super early. Like I've heard some stuff about it. I remember interviewing you and you were kind of like, "Yeah, d- yeah, like no, nah, you know, just kind of skirting around it." But I mean, dude, it's like it's like side imaging now. Everyone has some some form of forward facing right. sonar, but that was that would have been what 2017. I think it was. I, there was two up there, and both of them are really cool stories. 
the first time I won was to get into the classic at Grand, which was a super long shot, like one in a million. But I was driving up there and I had a friend call me and said, hey, can you take uh, one of my buddies fishing whenever you practice? And I was like, you know, uh, sure. Well, then I get to thinking about it and I'm like, no, it's, you know, we have an official practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I was like, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. So I call him back and then I, I realized, hey, we're going on Sunday. Sure, I'll take him. He's a police officer and all this kind of stuff. So I take him. I'm going to make the story as fast as I can. We're driving around. I pull up on a spot in the middle of the lake that's dirty. And I, if the wind's blowing hard. I cast my tube out there. And I catch a four-pounder. And I turn around. Look, he's not even got up. I throw out there, catch another four-pounder. And I turn to him. I'm like, dude, what's wrong? He goes, oh, this water is too muddy for there to be, you know, for this to be the winning spot. And I was like, all right, pull the trail motor up left. I won off of that spot, and each day the dude, volu- the guy that I took fishing, volunteered to carry the fish. And every day he carried my fish. And he's like, where did you catch these? I was like, dude, out of the muddy spot. So I won out of that spot that he never got up and fished. But to go back to 2017, yes, that was kind of the right when uh, Pan Optics came out. Yeah. And it was so funny because it was so dumb up there. I mean, like. It was just like rabbit hunting in an, in a concrete field with no weeds. And, you know, after it, you know, I talk about it, you know, how, how easy it was and nobody believed it. Everybody thought it was a sales pitch, you know, all this kind of stuff. And now what do you see? Everybody's running, everybody's, or most people's running it. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are fishing with it. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, I mean, was, you had that, I feel like, uh, you, Outside of what I think, I think Scott Martin was on that early Panoptic stuff because it was very two D looking, like yep. with blobs and colors and stuff, and and but there weren't that many guys. And I was I was going back and I was thinking about it. You might have been the earliest forward facing sonar winner uh, of a tour event. You just never talked about it. I talked about it, but people didn't listen. You know what I mean? Like I talked okay. about it after because I mean we're trying to. So, you know, okay, sell product. We're trying to promote a product, and but it was, I mean, it was true, and it just not a lot. I mean, people thought, well, it's a sales pitch, and you know what? It, the difference now, I'm sitting here looking at live scope. It's the same picture that we had in 2017 for the most part, except it was 2D, and it was just that pro. You know, and I could see it. You know, and the thing about that event is, a lot of guys had access to the same thing I did. They just didn't trust in it. But Mm -hmm. as soon as I saw it, um, I was on the lake with some engineers. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, was it every cast? Like every time you saw a blob and got the tube around it, it was like, boom. Yeah. If you I mean, they're smallmouth up north. I mean, I would literally just uh, float with the big waves and just take and pan. And if you saw one and the water was so clear, if you got within... 10 feet of him he was caught i mean not caught he was hooked you know i lost a lot but uh yeah it was it was that easy up there that's i i mean you've won 15 major tournaments over your career including bfls would you consider that to be the quote unquote easiest win of your career as far Uh, as you knew you were going to go out you knew you were going to catch him you knew it'd be tough for anyone to catch you yeah on, on that one um it wasn't easy because Jordan, I think Jordan was leading. I think Jordan had a, had a nice lead going into the last day. And I think he only caught three fish. Uh, so I kind of, oh, was that the mind. deal where he caught at the sturgeon afterwards with, uh, Zona so. when they went out the day after. Okay. Yeah, I, I think so, but not the easiest, you know, there's looking back, there's not been any that, that you would just say that were easy. I mean, they, they all, they, Every tournament, there would be something that would happen, like the Sabine. They would mm-hmm. make it tough. I mean, had the water not come up at Sabine, I really feel like I would have caught 13 to 15 pounds a day. Wow. But the water came up. You know, it threw me a curveball. And it's the same thing, you know, Hartwell, when I won on a spinnerbait, my first tour level win, you know, I'm stroking them and stroking them and stroking them. And the last day, I don't get a bite at 1130. You know, it, there's just, it's never been easy. Um, it's it's really never been easy. Did you really think you were going to run out of gas at the Sabine? 
I thought there was like a 99% chance of it. Like that wasn't playing it up for the mm. Fox Sports cameras. Like you're going, you're coming back going, I might not make the way in. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, there was a good chance of it, but there was no other place I wanted to fish. There was no other place that I knew that I had a chance to win. Uh, so it was, it was all in and, and I'm still kind of surprised that I made it. I'm more surprised that I made it without hitting something than I am on the gas because with it being on my electronics and I trust that, you know, I, that's, that's some of the stuff that I like to test whenever I get my boat during January, mm -hmm. you know, I'll run it out of gas. I'll fill it up. You know, I make sure that if it says I burn 12.3 gallons, when I go to the gas station, it holds 12.3 and it, I gain confidence in that stuff. So I had a lot of confidence, you know, in that Yamaha cable run to the Garmin that I knew that if it told me and I could keep my foot out of the gas, that it would be okay. It's just hard. You know, the wind played a part and running back, the tide moving played a part. Um, if there's just a lot of variables in that event. You like going to places like that or would you rather, like you've won at both of them, the ones where there's all sorts of different variables, tide, water running, fluctuation, log runs, tough bite, or go catch 25 pounds and 35 smallmouth on St. Clair. Like, which like one would tough, you? I like the tough ones better. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm a fisherman. I love to catch 25 pounds, but I think the tough ones are easier to win because a big part of it's up here. Uh -huh. uh, you know, 25 pounds, it just, it's just hard to keep that pace. Um, you know, and, and there's always, you know, a big fish thrown in there. Anyway, I just, I feel like the tougher events, um, mentally, they uh, demand a lot more. And, and I feel like, you know, just from experience, that 22 years you're talking about, if you just stay into it all day long and, and uh, don't give up, you know, if you get around them, you're going to catch some. Now you've won a bunch of small, uh, a bunch. You've won a couple, like three smallmouth tournaments. Uh, you fish for smallmouth a lot on uh, ten killer fisheries around like that. But recently and historically, you don't do really well on Thousand Islands. Like your last two there have not been spectacular finishes right. on that. Like, what is the? Do you get trying to drawn in to try to chase that largemouth deal on there with the frog, or is it just has that just been kind of an anomaly? Like you're comfortable out there, it just hasn't happened. No, the first time that we ever went there, I finished thirteenth. Right. And I lost, you know, a few fish. I should have made the top twelve easy, but and since then, I've just, uh, you know, this past year, there's at the end of the season, there's there's burnout and it happens to me. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's been a long season. You still want to do good, but Seth had a almost a hundred point or 80 point lead going in. And I just, there really wasn't anything to fish for, you know, and I, I, I say that respectfully to the sport, to mm -hmm. Seth, everything else, there just wasn't anything. And, you know, I'm like, well, I'm just going to stay close and, and try to catch 20 a day. And, and finish as high as I could when I knew driving up there that I should have ran to the lake. Um, you know, it was just one of those that I talked myself out of what I should have done. Um, and you know, the, the first time that I was there, I caught him doing something a little bit different and I keep trying to do that. It's just one of those that that tournament's always late in the season. Usually, you know, I'm locked into the classic and it's just, it's just hard. It's a hard event, and that place has them from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I just messed up this past year. Interesting. You well, know, here's what we're gonna practice. Practice was good. I mean, you know, that's the reason I stayed is because I, I spent one day of practice within five or ten miles of takeoff and caught 21, 22 pounds, and it was pretty easy. And I had a big school, and it's just one of those deals where you pull up to the big school, the big school's gone. You start fishing for loners, you lose a five pounder, you lose a four pounder. Then at 12 o'clock, you're like, man, I don't, you know, it's just, it's tough to catch up. You guys were out of Waddington this past year, but this year you're going out of Clayton, right? Yeah. That yeah, changes things, does it? Yeah, it does. And it, that's good for me because I've never been down there. You know, I want to fish stuff that I haven't been to. You have no history. Wait, um, you've never even like, you've never fished that section of river? Never. I've like never, you've never been out to the lake, make the run, fish Ontario, all this stuff around there. You just 
when it's out of Waddington all the years, you just stay in the river. Yeah. And that's, Interesting. Yeah, and that's, you know, and that tends to be me on a consistent basis. The more we go somewhere, the more I don't, I mean, I'm, I tend to not do good because you get locked into doing certain things. You get history on the lake. And I, and going out of Clayton is good news for me because I will not go west, east. I'm going to go west, all new water, and just something totally new. I spent... uh I think I spent like 12 days by myself in like a 200 square foot tiny cabin up there getting ready for that open this year. Yeah. And I had like three moments where I was like, oh, this is like the greatest day of my life. And then I like looked around and was like, and it might be the last day of my life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's something like you just can never get used to if you live in Oklahoma. Like it's yeah. it's totally different. I thought I'd been in rough water in Texoma and you fall in stuff, but it's like if you look more than like one wave ahead of you, you, your guts just go, you just, whoop, you're like, and I, I mean, I have a lot of experience, not as much experience as you. Do you still get that way on big water sometimes? Like, do you still have like, wow, this is really big moments? Yeah. I mean, you have to respect it. I mean, and even you follow in Texoma, you have to respect that. But when, when you get up there, like you have to realize that, the water is the is the beast and you have to i mean give it the utmost respect and do what you can but also you know over the years i've had a lot of confidence uh being out there you know i when you when i first saw it 15 years ago you're like oh i'm gonna sink that's not gonna happen uh as long as you respect it and be smart um and i love fishing and that stuff you know the harder it is to stand up the easier it seems like it is to catch them all right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to talk with you about, I don't know, have you ever guided? I don't know. We'll save that to, for when we come back after break, but like I... That's a I, good... I, I would like to talk about that. I, I want to talk about that with Jason. I don't know. I, people might be too intimidated to hire you for a day, <laughs> I'm but let- we'll talk about that and then uh, maybe sh- th- th- show some baits, and then I also want to get some advice for the Opens. Because when you came back, you just like tore through the open schedule. Six out of eight, top tens, four for four. And it was like, oh, well, yeah, that he made that look easy while the rest of us. So we'll be back with Jason Christie. It's Wednesday, BTL. I've made my living on the water for over 20 years. For 14 years. For over 23 years. I've worn a bunch of different clothing brands over the years. Some companies big. And some companies small. All of them said they were making clothing for us. But none of them knew us. None of them were us, except for one. Except for one. Except one. AFCO. 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 Fishing isn't part of us. It is us. The KVD 100 Jerkbait. 15 different colors. A perfect combination of roll, wiggle, and flash. Increased castability. 3D eyes. Premium black nickel hooks. KVD. Tie one on. Striking lures. So, you're looking to buy fishing electronics, huh? Are you also looking for true experts to help guide you through it? Well, at the Bass Tank, you've come to the right place. We are live forward facing sonar pioneers with thousands of hours spent learning through winning trophies, cashing checks, and just having fun. Whatever brand you need, we have it. We offer free shipping and we have two financing options available. Our experts are here to help you. Call us today or visit thebasstank.com. Hey guys, Major League Fishing Pro Jacob Wheeler here with my new Signature Series line of rods with Ducket Fishing. We have my 7.2 crank and rod right here. Crankbaits can be very fickle and having the right, you know, having a lot of tip can be too much and having not enough tip can, you know, lose a lot of fish. So you really got to be careful. If there's one or two techniques that I'm really, really adamant about having the perfect action is a crankbait, especially like a square bill, a DT6. Um, you know, those medium running crankbaits in the springtime when those fish's mouth are pretty tough. That's when I'm really, really, really on top of having my actions just perfect. Elite Series Pro Daryl Gleason here. My Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries 
It's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different. And really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic. That gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.xzonelures.com and check them out for yourself. I think that would be a good way to come. Welcome back. BTL on a Wednesday. Got a couple new commercial spots in there. Actually built built a couple of those uh, over the last day. So big shout out to Daryl Gleason. Uh, one of the new sponsors jumping on this year, uh, sponsored me last year, is Pro Guide Batteries with the lithium. So we're going to get Matt Looney on here in the next couple of months and talk everything batteries. Because nothing sucks more than going out and it not working. That's why Jason spends a whole month getting all of his stuff ready. Uh, all right, we're back, Jason Christie. And before the break, I brought up, you know, there's a lot of guys around Oklahoma. And at some point, I kind of remember almost all of them guiding a little bit, getting into it. But I don't ever remember you jumping into the guide game. I did. You did? Yep. Let's so, hear it. And that's kind of going to bring me into what I wanted to talk about today. So... You know, most of us that fish, you need some sort of supplement, supplemental income. Um, I did some guiding. You know, this is back whenever, you know, I'd bought my first or second boat. You know, I wiped it off every time, wanted to keep it clean. Anyway, a lot of, I learned that a lot of these people you take guiding weren't the best fishermen. And I don't live on a lake like St. Clair. You know, it's tough, it's tough for me to catch them, much less somebody else. Well, the day that I stopped guiding, I had three foreign clients that came in they couldn't cast they couldn't speak english so we ended up trolling for sand bass and one of the kids would lay his reel on the side of the gunnel of the boat and every time he caught one his his rod would of course snap back and the star drag on the reel just scratched up all the top of my boat and then that's when i realized that it wasn't worth the money i kind of took a year off from guiding and then i came up with an idea called the school of bass you could book one day two days or three days it wasn't guiding it was teaching and i remember my first client i don't remember his name but we met um on grand lake and the first day we fished shallow and, and i caught we both caught like 25 pounds and he kept talking about wanting to go to the river and fish and i was like dude the river it's not time it's not time so he's like, I want to go up there. I want to learn it. So the second day we went up there and the best I could do was like 10 pounds. The third day we went down the lake, jerked a rogue and caught 25 pounds. So after it was over, you know, I kind of wanted to evaluate, you know, what had happened and stuff. And I was like, you, you know, did you have fun? He's like, yeah. I was like the first day or the third day, he goes, no, by far the day that I learned the most and the day that I'll never forget was the second day. He said, because I watched you all day, wheels turning in the mud, trying to figure out something, and you never did. He said, I relate more to that than I do catching 25 flipping willows or catching 25 jerking a rogue. So uh, I did that for a few years. I charged a lot of money intentionally because I didn't want to do a lot of them. And also, I wanted that was right when I was getting started. I wanted to put people in my boat that were presidents of banks, uh, owners of companies, you know, potential sponsors mm -hmm. that never panned out. But, um, I probably learned more from those trips because people would ask questions, you know, we would evaluate every bite and I, you know, I learned things. And what was funny is when I would take people to grand, I didn't want to take them where I fished. Right. So we would go to the lower end. And I learned that the lower end had fish too. You know, a lot of these <laughs> lakes around here where I would take people, we would go the opposite direction that I would normally go. And I learned a lot of things. So uh, 
Yeah, and that kind of brings me to the next thing. So we're starting something new. I'm jumping into the Hallman Panger Act. Uh, oh, Hallman mentioned this on Monday. He teased it. Yeah, we uh, we started yesterday. And I don't know if you saw the picture last night, but, you know, I hired a guy. He's local. He's from Tulsa, Brandon. Um, he's really, really good at what he does. And we're just going to film stuff. You know, yesterday was one of those days. We had good days where we crushed them. I mean, like a seven and a half, an eight and a half. Uh, but we're going to film everything. There's, you know, we're getting ready to leave. He's standing right here. We're going to leave. We're going to go jerk a rogue today. You know, and if we don't catch them, we don't catch them. Uh, but we're going to film it and uh, just, you know, just try to teach people. Um, teach people how to catch them. Teach people um, not to break your rod when you don't catch them. Is this something that... Uh... Is this something that, that you, like, your sponsors were like, hey, is this something that came about from Edwin and all the guys talking? Is this something that you just feel the time is right and you really want to do? Like, like why now? Um, the biggest reason for me was that there is a lot of guys coming into the industry. Mm -hmm. I'm getting older. At the end of this year, at the end of 2022, whenever – these contracts come across the table, you know, for my sponsors, I don't even want them to question it. I want them to look and be like, we absolutely not can get rid of this guy. Matter of fact, he probably needs double pay joking on that, but you know, it's just something where I don't want to be outworked. And mm -hmm. there's some of these guys right now that are outworking me in that video aspect things, part of things. And I don't want to be outworked. And, and like I say, I think what this is going to lead to, I learned it yesterday, just the first day of doing it. Whenever you're having to catch them and talk to the camera, you're evaluating those bites just like I did 12, 15 years ago, which is kind of getting me going. You don't just go through the motions like, like I do a lot of times when I go fishing. And, you know, I have a good bit of time to do it uh, when I'm home. So we're going to kick it off. So down the pipe in the next couple of weeks, um, be expecting some new content that's awesome is it just just search jason what is it jason christie fishing yep what jason christie fishing on youtube yep and we've had a channel i mean yeah but the difference is there was no content on there that mm -hmm. was unique it whatever you know the tackle tip tuesdays that went on facebook or instagram you know they would kick over to youtube there's been no unique content over yeah. there well dude there's been some unique stuff that you've done though when you do like instagram or facebook lives from like 10 killer or the water like it would it didn't surprise me but like dude you would you would have like a thousand people just watching you fish and it's just the camera there and the audio's not that great but i mean like that was really good content like i remember there was one you're like flipping the bushes and they weren't biting that good and you start and i was like holy cow this is and you i look at it there's like 1100 people and you didn't announce it or anything. It was just right. like, hey, I'm live now. And and I mean that. And then my buddies are calling me. Like, are you watching Jason right now fishing? Yeah. And then Mark Jeffries is like, we need to do a one-on-one, -on -one, Matt. And I'm like, well, yeah, you just watched Jason fish for seven hours out there. You know where to go. That yeah. type of thing. But that was kind of unique stuff. Like that, there weren't a bunch of people who were doing that. I really enjoyed that. Um, the problem with that is the Facebook is that the audio you know, trying to, trying to do Facebook, you have to be somewhere it's calm. And I, you yeah. know, I'd pull into a pocket that's flat calm. You look across the lake, the winds crashing the bank. I wanted to be over there, um, catching them and stuff like that. But that's something that I enjoy doing. And we're going to do some more of that. Um, you know, like you say that we'd have a lot of people watching and then I would kick back after a week and look at those videos and they'd have 50, 75,000 views. And that's kind of where, um, you know, and working the classic people coming up saying, man, I watch your videos. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish you'd do more. And that's kind of all of that put together is where, you know, it's what led to us kind of going to put a lot of effort into this YouTube moving forward. Uh, kind of along those lines. And I'm sure a lot of the filming will be in Oklahoma. I've, I've preached this for 10 years on BTL and, and, and said it, I feel, and, and you're the, the, best guy who could tell me if this is true or not i feel like the best tournament lake in the country think about that statement let that sink in mm -hmm. you're talking 
spreading out, fishing, different techniques, species, year round, is Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma. And there's just not the infrastructure. There hasn't been really many major, you know, tour event tournaments there. When everyone thinks Oklahoma, they think Alabama. But when I look at it, when I look down the list of of anglers, when I look at that fishery and what it offers and how Terry Butcher can catch him one way and a guy can run to the dam and catch him another way and you could have first and second on a drop shot in 30 water and flipping bushes in two foot and it's 100,000 acres and it's got spotted bass and big smallmouth and big largemouth, it's got to be the best tournament lake in the country, doesn't it, Jason? I don't know. The only problem with that lake is it is a hundred thousand, but they live on like twenty thousand acres. Or I haven't fished there in ten years. But back when I used to fish, it's the best. I mean, like you say, I like lakes like that. That's why I'm excited about the classic. I like really big venues when we go fishing, um, just so I don't have to see people. Uh, and you follow us like that, but man, I will tell you, there is some dead water in that place. Um, there's some really, really good water. That 20,000 acres that they live in is good, but there's a lot of dead water uh, on that lake as well. And, I, you know, I enjoy – We've I've run an hour south before, just like you were talking about. I've run 45 – I've run dang near to Henrietta, um, and I've been to the dam fishing tournaments. Uh, I haven't fished there in a long time, though. But, uh, yeah, it's a good lake. I mean, I, I would like to see a true level event go there even if it's not us mm -hmm. just to kind of see how the if it's still like it used to be because you know whenever i quit fishing if you weren't in that twenty thousand acres you just weren't i mean and i don't mean like a block i mean there might be two thousand scattered acres down south there might be five thousand in the middle you know a lot of it goes on around the dam and then some of it up it all depends on the time of year yeah i just remember i mean i've i've fish it off at audit you could put in at different parts of that lake and you're like it's literally like fishing five different lakes yeah it is i mean you can be drop shotting with four foot visibility or you can't even see the blades on your spinnerbait yeah all right couple more things and we're gonna let you go because you are going fishing today right i am all right you got anything you want to show talk about anything else there uh not really i mean i didn't i just i grabbed what the topic of today what we're going to film on today like the gold for today, I thought about it last night when I went to bed, is I just want to go catch a big one. You know, I'm going to go somewhere where I can jerk a rogue, and I don't care if I just catch one today. I want to catch a big one. There's sometimes I go fishing, I go to 10 killer. You know, I'll tie on a bandit. I just want to catch 30. But there's days that I want to catch a big one, and uh, that's what we're going to do today. And this right. is what we're going to be. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, a little, little bit the other way. That's uh, for those listening on iTunes, which I feel like that might become my favorite saying on the show now. For those listening on iTunes, that is Jason Christie's Magical Rogue Box, which when we uh, filmed some AFCO stuff, uh, was that two years ago now, I believe? Remember, it was, it was literally like sleeting, and it was the most miserable time I've ever had on the water. And yeah. And I remember being in the back of your boat and just thinking, don't be a baby. Don't be a baby. Don't be a baby. And Jason's like, well, we'll just go around this corner and see if we can't hook one up. And I'm like, or we could go to the ramp. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it was you miserable. Saying, yeah. You brought your boat and you were going to fish the rest of the day. And whenever we were done, you loaded up and went home. It was probably one of the coldest that, that I've ever been. But I do remember going and seeing your uh, rogue box. And what impressed me about your rogue box was there was like, those are all like fishers. Like there's, they're not like brand, like a lot of them in your rogue box aren't brand sparkly new. Like they're fishers is what you call them. You know, like the wiggle warts, right? If you're, if someone's like, Hey, pick a, pick a wiggle wart out. You never pick the new one without hook rash. You pick right. the one that's beat up. And like all of your rogues were beat up and had different lead strips and weights and paints and all sorts on them. And it was the first time that I'd seen like a full box of beat up baits and yeah. that, to me was super impressive i got okay so before we close the show i'm going to send you a picture because i don't want you to i don't want you to agree to anything until you know what what you're getting into okay okay so bear with me here because i have a, a proposition there are i i get sick of everyone going when are you guys going to do the rematch and post it on that stuff for the one-on-one -on -one. it's like my highest viewed video ever but i have a proposition that i think you might you might be in on 
but I have to send you this picture first. Hold on. I got to scroll through it and find it. I was thinking about these rogues here. The, honestly, there's probably some rogues in there that there's probably a rogue in there that I want to be FL on in like 03, 04. You know, really? a rogue is bait you just don't lose unless you break the bill, which I hardly ever do. You know, you hit a rock or something, you just don't lose any. What's the best I haven't got year? A picture yet. I'm sending it right now. What's the best year for rogues? Like, I heard guys like 94s, 97s, 2001s, 2004s, different color packs, like when you're going vintage rogues. The best year? Like, you're talking about the bait or fishing wise? The bait. Like, there's different, there's all sorts of different uh, vintage rogues out there if you start. I mean, well, this is all of these, they don't make anymore. Yeah. Five and a half inch rogue. But the good news is, from popular demand, we're getting ready to make some more. Uh, really? Because a lot of guys reach out. So I don't know. It's probably going to be, it's going to be soon. I don't know when. But we're going to make, you know, we're going to pick a number, make them, sell them, be done with it. Is the last time they kind of came out with the Rogue was when they did the Perfect 10. That was right before the Classic, wasn't it? Yeah, which a Perfect Grand? 10 is, is one of the highest sellers that they have. There, But it all goes north. They're trolling them for walleye. That's what you know, Frank said. It, but uh, <laughs> that's where a lot of the sales is going is up there catching those giant walleye. That's what Frank Scaler said. They were like, hey, make six more colors of rogues and make them all like clown colors. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. What? They said they're all walleyes. So so when it, that's going to be coming out then soon, huh? Uh, Yeah. All right. Did you get the picture? I did. All right. Zoom in on that thing. I just want you to check out the – I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say it, but check out the girth on that picture I just sent you. Yeah. Is that – you talking about your girth or the crappie? Because <laughs> you look that's like a, you've gained a few. I have. I've gotten kind of chunky. <laughs> That's a big crappie. Uh, yeah. So, I I mean, you're obsessed with crappie fishing as well. I know that. We like, caught, for 45 minutes yesterday, we caught them every cast. I, I know. Think. I saw it, and it looked like there was one in there that was big. Yeah. It was way bigger than the one you sent me the picture of. How big was the one you had? I don't know. I'm just giving you a hard time. So, you want to do, you... do a crappie one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. So, in the crappie world, they go with best seven. Okay. And you just weigh them on the digital, and you keep you mm -hmm. keep your best seven. I don't even know if we'll be able to put five bass in the live well with what's going on with the Oklahoma regulations. It might just be the one over 16 here pretty soon. But I've never done a, a crappie, and I know you kind of fancy yourself a crappie angler. I've seen the posts, and it's pretty impressive. You're really good at putting a little jig on them in deep water and catching them. Yeah, well, there's, there's two things that I enjoy about that. One is it's supper. I mean, I'm having crappie tonight. And two, honestly, is it it's practice for I mean it's live scope practice, you know, for the rest of the year. I get out there and that's how I gain confidence. If I can see a crappie jig seventy five feet and watch a crappie eat it, I know that if I drop a spoon or a spinner bait or something like that on a bass, I'm for sure gonna see that. Yeah. So I mean it's really practicing for bass, but yeah, I, I mean I enjoy doing it. Are you down for a for a one on one best seven? crappie derby uh, my question to you is how many days are you going to practice for this you can't keep bringing that up i it we it i will happens, practice it, so we have to establish uh there were no rules beforehand no there were i'm just uh, saying there it, was there was it was a gray area yeah there was a gray area and you uh you uh yeah I, how many days are you going to practice this is my question if i was fishing if 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 you were in my shoes and it was a gray area, would you not have been out there practicing for a couple hours? Just be no, honest. Because, if you were in my shoes. No, because I want to put my head on the pillow at night and go to sleep. I don't want to be have a guilty conscience. So you still have a guilty conscience because you're denying it. But I didn't make you pay. I'm not denying it. No. Well, there was dude, nothing that said I, we couldn't practice. I went money. out for three hours the day before. It's not about the money. It's the fact that you have a video out there that's got... 500 whatever thousand views and i am the i'm the brunt of the joke on that deal no there's not that's that's not a joke at all dude it's a joke to me see i'm still intimidated because i almost just offered to take it down and then i was like grow a pair keep it up there like yeah but here's the crazy thing on that video last year 
I did not catch a single fish in the same area or doing what I did the day before that I had practiced. I caught them completely opposite of how I thought I would. So Dude, it actually... Don't, don't defend yourself. Let's move on because right. it ain't going to do any better. I mean, you... Um, yeah, you... Would, would you like a would you like a day of crappie practice beforehand? No, I don't Can we practice? Where, where are we going to do this at? That's the thing. Uh, that's the problem here because the crappie fishing because like I have my spots and you have your spots, right? So I know you're probably running through your head like four or five different places that you think you could put a hurting on pound and a half to two pound crappie, and I am as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, off air. And I know you're super busy in this. It's just like an afternoon deal. You, we, we might even be able to have two people for a boat if you want to bring someone. Tonight. Not John or Zeke. Those yeah. people. That's a no-go on John or Zeke. That's an unfair advantage. Unless it's John and Zeke, and then I get John or Zeke and vice versa. Then that's the only way that works. Um, okay. But we'll, we'll see if we have any fisheries in common that we both think we can catch them. Because I feel, have you ever, I feel like I fish for crappie differently than you fish for crappie. I like to catch them out of like 50 foot suspended. That's my favorite way to catch them. Yeah. So we, we fish for crappie very differently because mm -hmm. my, most of my crappie this time of year will be seven to 10 foot, yeah. possibly six or shallower. But I think yeah. that would be fun. I've never actually done the seven fish crappie tournament. Yeah. Are you agreeing I don't care. to that? I mean, it's, it's... Zero practice. No practice. We'll just try to find a, a fishery that's both in common that we both think we can catch them on. Sounds good. All right. Man, you end the interview and make me feel like I did something wrong. And we post that on my channel. Yeah, you. no, uh, that that was what I was going to say. 100%. We'll post it on your channel. Okay. Or we could do the, a bass rematch and post it on your channel this time. Whatever okay. you want. Sounds good. All right. Dude, I appreciate it. Like I said, this is the first week of, uh, of BTL, and I definitely wanted to get you uh, on probably one of the most requested guests on btl over the past five or ten years and like look i'm not sucking up to you like this is not it but like there are a lot of people in oklahoma that are really proud that jason christie is from oklahoma no other place i'd rather live all right go catch him today and then you can watch it on jason christie's youtube channel on jason christie fishing man i greatly appreciate it thank you for joining me on Wednesday, January 5th for BTL. Man, he was kind of giving me the business there. But I kind of expected that. That's why I preemptively struck with the crappie. Because when you... Like, we did a one-on-one, -on -one and it was I got a lucky big bite, and I ended up a couple ounces ahead of him. And I knew that it was like a... It's fishing, right? So we talk about this all the time. There's... It's not like tennis or golf or basketball where when someone's better than someone, it's a hundred times out of a hundred times. Like, I've got a little bit of a chance to beat them because of the randomness in fishing and it happened. But the more you do it, that's why there's eight events in a season. That's why there's four days in a tournament. That's why the Angler of the Year is a, a combination of a number of days. The consistency of the better angler rises to the top and the luck factor is reduced the longer and longer and the more data points you have so the more data points i get with jason the more likely it is that there's no feather in my cap listen i went out and mark jeffries that same year three months later absolutely annihilated me on 10 killer i had a five bass limit for four pounds jeffries had 11 pounds and crete beat me on mert so that was it. Thanks for tuning in. Great live numbers this week. I really appreciate uh, everyone tuning in and listening to that. Hey, we still have uh, stars, likes, and reviews on iTunes and the podcast platform if you are so inclined. And if not, go ahead and leave a uh, review there. Also, a little bit of update on the BTL merchandise. So that store from the holiday drop, uh, a lot of people got great merch. I love seeing that in the uh, DMs and on Instagram, I always post it, but uh, that store will remain open. It was not like a two week drop. It's under the shop BTL tab. So if you want to get a hat, a sweatshirt, anyone, you got gifts coming up, whatever. It's just what's up there now will stay up there until it's sold out. And then they'll just be like the standard BTL hat, a shirt, uh, like a long sleeve, and then the stickers and 
stuff like that. And then what the plan is, is like every quarter or every six months as there's as needed, like a specific, like my favorite color is seven shirt. Uh, we'll come out with those in like special limited runs. So greatly appreciate uh, the support tomorrow. Jason Chrissy kind of teased it. We got to see his rogue box. Frank Scalish is on, and I don't think he's going to be here now, but believe it or not, Frank Jr. is coming in tomorrow night, and then we're going fishing Friday and Saturday and maybe Sunday too. So looking forward to uh, day four with Frank Scalish tomorrow. Big thanks to Brad Hallman, Jordan Lee, and Jason Christie in the first week of BTL. That's it. We'll see you tomorrow for day four.